Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, a very warm welcome to Tilburg University. Welcome to the award ceremony of the Max von der Stuhl Human Rights Prize. My name is Nicola Jegers. I am the Professor of International Human Rights Law here at the Law Faculty. And it's my honor to welcome you all uh, to our campus today. A very special uh, warm welcome to our keynote speaker today, Professor Rianne Lechet, President of Maastricht University. And I will introduce her a little bit more a bit later. And I'm also really happy to welcome our president of our university, our rector, Professor Wim van der Donk, our dean of our law school, Professor Van Vaken, and our vice deans. It's great to see you all here today. And finally, um, a very warm welcome to colleagues and friends from the Netherlands Network of Human Rights Research, which is the collaboration between 11 universities across the Netherlands in the field of human rights. And the awards that we are handing out today, the Max von der Stuhl Human Rights Award, is a joint initiative between the Netherlands Network of Human Rights and Tilburg Law School. So today we will be awarding the Max von der Stuhl Human Rights Award, which is a prize which is meant as an incentive for students and early career scholars to conduct academic research in the field of human rights. And this year, we've got quite some things to celebrate, or to mark, at least. First of all, our law school celebrates its 60th anniversary here in Tilburg. So we've been celebrating that all year round, and today we also want to celebrate that fact. We will also be awarding um, the Max von der Stuhl Prize for the 26th time. Also something to celebrate. And on the 10th of December, it will be 75 years ago that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN General Assembly, a milestone document for the protection of human rights. However, if we look around current, uh, the current situation in the world, the pressure on human rights, rights around the world, you may wonder whether celebration actually is the appropriate word to use. However, I would argue that attention for human rights the principles, uh, the principles laid out in the 30 provisions of the Universal Declaration is more relevant than ever. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a testament of our common humanity and continues to be the foundation and the inspiration of all those treaties and frameworks that have been adopted and continue to be adopted in international uh, efforts, um, on development, humanitarian assistance, and peace and security. And it's people like Max van der Stoel that play a pivotal role in promoting human rights around the world. And the prizes we will be awarding today are named after Max van der Stoel, who worked tirelessly to address conflict and promote human rights in the Netherlands and around the world. As Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Netherlands, as High Commissioner on National Minorities, for the OSCE and in many other roles, also as professor of international and European law right at this university. And that's why this prize carries his name. So later today, um, we will be announcing the winners. And I know quite some nominees are, in, uh, are here today. So you'll have to, uh, we'll keep you in suspense a little bit longer. Because first, um, we have the honor to listen to our keynote speaker, Professor Rianne Lechet. But before I introduce her, I would uh, very much welcome our rector, Professor Van der Donk, to the, to the floor to welcome you all to our campus. Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, dear friends and colleagues, Rianne, a colleague and a friend, now in Maastricht University, but back on also her campus. We will never forget you. You're one of us. Um, and you're all one of us. And I'm happy to say just a few words. We will never be there with just a declaration. I'm a fan of Jacques and Raisa Marita, two eminent scholars who were, especially Jacques, was involved heavily in drafting that and the pre-documents of that Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
and we as Tilburg University, being a Catholic university, our roots are in that notion of universal declarations in the sense that we can never forget and should never and will never forget that talking about human rights is not just an academic endeavor in order to investigate thoroughly and constantly the involvement of declarations and the difficult processes that are always related to keeping alive the notion of international rights in a world that 75 years ago was recovering from a war, uncertain times, and still kept that notion of hope that is always related to that universal declaration of human rights alive, because we can never lose hope, and we will never forget that humans deserve that notion of hope, even in those difficult times that we are living in this world time and over again. It's not just a declaration, I said, because it always required hard work, like people from Max von der Stuhl. He was indeed, as you said, Nicola, one of those impressive people that always in the most difficult situations, when it was even very difficult and hard to believe that that notion of universal declaration of human rights something in the world, he never lost hope and traveled when necessary time and again to, to keep that hope alive, but not only hope, also the notion of the little steps that always are necessary to work very hard in international relationship and even in non-statal actor formations to, to see what we can do to do that. And this is demanding not only diplomats, but also scholars to be devoted to that mission. So we are extremely proud, and I'm thinking, speaking also on behalf of the Dean of the School of Law of Tilburg University that uh, has his 60th anniversary, not yet 75 does. But 75 is, and we will have to put pressure on that, uh, a very important moment in the international order, I would say. Because when we had that festivities here in the Netherlands of remembering the 75th um, um, anniversary of the liberation of our country and our in Europe, um, that was in the midst of COVID. And one of the things I deplored was that, so it was a little bit in the shadow, that that idea that we could uh, commemorate um, uh, the formation of the United Nations. Happily, there will be a second opportunity thus. The treaty, Universal Declaration, is indeed 75 years this September. And I think we should do our, our utmost from all the perspectives here in this audience and also from an academic point of view, to seize that moment not only as a moment of commemoration, but also as an invitation to think, to reflect, and to be alert. And in that sense, it's an honor for me as rector and president of this university to host this event for uh, the 26th time, I heard you say, because it is just, again, here, not just a declaration, it's an effort, it's a vocation that we all are committed to in this university. In that respect, um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words, Nicola. I hand over the floor to you again. Thank you and be welcome in our university again. Thank you, uh, Wim, thank you. So, I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker. We were really delighted when uh, Professor Letchett accepted our invitation to come and speak here today and was able to free up time in her extremely busy schedule as president of Maastricht University. As I mentioned, it's 60 years ago that our Tilburg Law School uh, started. And um, so we thought it would be great if we would have a really successful, inspiring alumnus to come and speak to, to us here today. And Professor Letchett, Rianne Letchett, started her career here in Tilburg. So it's also a welcome home a little bit, I would say. Um, so um, Rianne Letchett started, uh, started here, wrote her PhD, and that makes it extra special, under the supervision of Max van der Stoel. And also of, of Willem van Genuchten, Professor Willem van Genuchten, who's here today. So that's also really nice. So after writing her PhD, she became director of the International Victimology Institute, Intervict, here at Tilburg University, where she established a master's degree in victimology and criminal justice. And in 
2015, I think it was, uh, Rian and the team were awarded the prestigious um, VD grant to study the impact of international tribunals on society and individuals that have been uh, confronted with serious human rights violations and international crimes. And throughout her career, Rihanna Lechit has always been very dedicated and committed a lot of time to translating scientific knowledge into social impact. So we couldn't have thought of a better person to come speak to us here today. So it's an honor to welcome you back to campus to address us on this occasion. And um, Professor Lechit has indicated she'd be very happy to answer a couple of questions if there is time. So keep that in mind if you have things you'd like to ask at the end of her lecture. Rihanna, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Nikolai. Let me just take this off. It's not really functioning. Uh, this really feels at home. I think I've been in this room, I don't know how many times, with students, with staff, with Studium Generale events, and even with some of the same faces uh, that were also there when I was here, both a student and a staff member, because I started also as a student at this university. So I think it was almost 20, 25 years that I have been walking around on this campus. And when I entered the campus uh, this afternoon, I looked around and I thought, where is that building? Suddenly a whole building is gone, Wim. What are you doing? You're completely restructuring this, uh, this campus. No, I'm, so I'm very, very honored to be here, not only because of the fact uh, that it, I'm an alumni of this university, but also because it's your anniversary, uh, 60 years, stronger together. That's the slogan that you gave to the anniversary year. And I also included Stronger Together in the uh, presentation title for today. And third reason why it's an honor has to do with this uh, very special uh, man whose name was rightly given uh, to this award. Uh, so when Nikolai called me and said, would you like to give the well, lecture? I'm not doing an official lecture, by the way. You will, uh, uh, you will find out in a minute. Um, I thought I really, really am very pleased that, uh, that uh, she asked me to come here today. Because indeed, Max von der Stoel uh, was my supervisor together with Willem and Asbjorn Eide, a professor in international law and human rights law from the Norwegian Institute of Human Rights. So I had the dream team, three uh, very uh, experienced uh, persons who each from their own experience and, and knowledge added value to my PhD trajectory. And Max von der Stuhl came at a time um, when it was not so maybe common to appoint uh, persons with a vast practical experience as honorary professors. And I still even remember, probably Willem as well, that people were also looking a little bit like, why is someone getting the title of professor without an academic background? Uh, and I was just very pleased because I knew that writing a PhD on national minority rights, because that was my topic, could so much benefit from someone who was working from within the field, who could uh, provide uh, analysis on what would work in practice besides my legal and theoretical analysis. So I had the perfect combination uh, to write a PhD on the impact of national minority rights instruments. And I'll get to that uh, a little bit later because what for me is crucial in the 45 minutes, and I will try to make it half an hour so that for 15 minutes we can have a debate together, is the word impact. It's the word impact that you want to create with the work that you do as a scholar, as a human rights activist, whatever role that you have, as a theorist in law, uh, what drives you to do what you do every day, uh, often in our jobs seven days a week, is that the impact that you want to have on society? Is it the impact you want to have on science? It can differ the answers. But the word impact, which was also in my PhD title, I, it's, it's becoming like a pattern uh, in, in my life. Max von der Stuhl was often referred to as the quiet diplomat. Um, whereas, as, as Nicola rightly said, he was uh, our foreign minister. He was uh, our ambassador at the UN in New York. He was special rapporteur on the situation in Iraq. And in the different roles that he had, he sometimes also took the role of speaking out, speaking out on human rights abuses, confronting governments with the abuses that he witnessed. And the role that he had as the OSCE High Commissioner uh, on National Minorities was, was that quiet diplomat role. But he could have both, he had both roles in his career. 
And I got to know him in the role of the quiet uh, diplomat. Um, and I had the honor and the privilege to also travel at some point with him to uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, as it was then called. And that was a fascinating trip. And you can also imagine that I was extremely nervous because I was, how old was I, Willem? I was 20-something, uh, beginning of my 20s, going with someone also with his reputation uh, to uh, a country where I was going to do some empirical field work, uh, traveling together with him. Well, uh, if the young students and PhDs here in the room, you can imagine that you want to show yourself from your best side so that he would also understand, well, she's a good PhD and, and a good uh, future academic or whatever career she might uh, embark upon. Well, what happened during that trip? I made two really stupid mistakes. And I just want to share with you also for the students and the staff that is a little bit younger uh, and not only bring you the theories and uh, yeah, because the, the audience is mixed, I see. Um, and I really believe also in failing forward. So while you fail, you learn from it and that helps you. The two mistakes. Well, the first was uh, we traveled to Macedonia. Back then it was a country not as far uh, in its development as it is now, even though the tensions are also increasing again in that region. And we had a, we booked a hotel. We were also staying in the same hotel. We were traveling around the country all the time. And at some point, of course, at the end of the trip, you have to pay the bills of your hotel. And what happened? My credit card didn't work. I couldn't pay anything uh, that we had calculated for the entire week. So I had to go to him early morning. I said, uh, Max, I cannot pay my hotel bill. Uh, can I please borrow some uh, money from you? Because suddenly my credit card, which was the first time I had a credit card and I was traveling with a credit card. Well, Max wouldn't be Max that he started laughing and, and looked at me like, no worries, I'll pay your bills. We'll arrange it back in uh, when we are back in uh, uh, in Tilburg. So that was the kind of man he was. And the second mistake was a professional mistake. We were all the time together in cars, in offices, uh, besides the time that I was doing my interviews. And he was having a lot of conversations, uh, official conversations with uh, all sorts of representatives that I would hear uh, and listen to while not even uh, knowingly listening, but I was in the same place. And then in the evening, at one of the uh, evening uh, events, we went to the embassy the, of the Dutch ambassador there. That was also like a nervous thing for me going to an ambas uh, ambassador, uh, official reception. And the ambassador introduced herself, wanted to have a chat with me. And I said, oh, congratulations with your new position. And then she said, how do you know that? And I thought, oh my God, I don't know that, of course. I heard it, <laughs> but I don't know it. And, I've, and, I, and she was really pissed. She was really very, uh, honestly, you know, it wasn't like, okay, we, we, we uh, I think I would do that probably, like, okay, it's okay, uh, well, uh, don't talk about it even further. You know, she was very cross. So I thought, what do I do? I, well, you just, I just passed through the evening. We went back in the car, and the first thing I said when we were back in the car together, I said, oh, I made a terrible mistake. I t told Max, I said, I did this and that. And I heard you in one of the conversations and I, out of my nerve, what do I say to this ambassador woman? I said this. Yeah, he said, I know you did that because she came to me and she's really very uh, frustrated and cross with you. <laughs> but the fact that you now say it to me uh, also, again, uh, underlines that I can trust you. And I'm very happy that you said it out of yourself. Get over it and she should not overreact so much. I'm fine with it. That is also, was also Marx. And that was very important for me to uh, learn also. I sh always have to be honest. Also, if I make mistakes and, 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 make, and mess up, uh, and then hope that the person that I'm messing up with will understand. Well, Marx was the kind of man that, uh, that did that. So he had a beautiful influence on me as a person, in his leadership style, in his humanity, and of course, also in his work. Uh, but that is uh, also the reason why he got this uh, beautiful uh, named award. Now, that's the first topic of my lecture, Max. Second, the Universal Declaration, 75 years. That is indeed something to uh, reflect upon. And while I was discussing with uh, Nicola the topic of today's presentation, uh, we did not have the situation in Israel-Palestine. 
uh, we did not have an election result in the Netherlands as we have now. And while we were re preparing and, and reflecting upon today, we had different topics in mind. And I actually started also writing my keynote lecture, like word for word. It's actually ready somewhere in my uh, uh, laptop. Uh, but when this day approached, I felt very uncomfortable with giving that lecture that I had prepared, looking at the world as we see it uh, today. So I decided I will skip that lecture and I will uh, discuss with you how important it is that uh, human rights scholars and human rights activists um, play the role uh, that they have and actually that the role that they have should be very much uh, strengthened and enforced because there is enough reason why human rights scholars and human rights activists should stand up and speak out. And that all the values in the Universal Declaration and in all the treaties that came afterwards should never be taken for granted. It is not a paper reality. It is a document and the treaties also coming afterwards that want to have impact on the lives of those people, citizens, vulnerable groups that need protection. And we never, for me also as a human rights scholar and an international rights lawyer, I never wanted to study these legal frameworks only from the perspective on theorizing on them and on making the legal framework even better without also knowing how I could make sure that it would have impact on those who need to have that protection. And I think there we still fail. We still fail as scholars and maybe to some extent as activists. And that that is also the reason why we have to think together how we can make sure that also together, stronger together, not for nothing, that that's also the slogan of the law school, how we can make sure that the impact that we want to have with the legal framework that we have developed and the legal institutions that we have created have the impact on our societies and on the individuals in our societies. And that is really difficult and that requires also speaking out. And speaking out for me is at the moment also a dilemma that I wanted to share with you. When I was only a human rights scholar, I never hesitated to speak out, whether it was on my social media, whether it was uh, in my uh, experiences with other stakeholders, uh, both academically or in government uh, positions, I always felt the autonomy to be able to speak out and to also uh, show my concerns about the human rights violations that I saw, whether it was in the countries in which my research takes place, and that is in Congo, Guatemala, in Cyprus, so countries where uh, we often have seen and still see uh, situations of mass victimization, but also closer to home when I thought that our own government was violating uh, refugee rights. Um, and now in my role as president of Maastricht University, I feel less uh, autonomous, uh, less independent to speak out. And that's becoming an internal uh, dilemma in my, uh, I have a, driving here, I thought it's almost like schiz schizophrenic, uh, that at the one, uh, when, when one, uh, one side of me wants to speak out on violations that I see and where I think we should draw much more attention to. And on the other, the other side of me is president of an institution in which the opinions and the views on certain societal issues are so much uh, diverse that speaking out from my name uh, representing this entire institution becomes sometimes even problematic. And I'll give you the example of Israel and Palestine, which is a topic I think close to anyone's heart here in the audience, witnessing every day again civilians being uh, murdered, being slaughtered, uh, being uh, whose rights on, on all levels are being violated. Uh, people being held hostage, uh, people in Gaza uh, being bombed. And if I talk to our community inside the university, there's one group that says you need to condemn every action of the Israeli government. And that's the only statement that we want. We don't want any other statement besides this statement. There's also a group that says 
we of course don't want you to release such statements. We want you to stay neutral. Uh, you can facilitate the academic dialogue and the academic debates about these topics. That's the role of university. But we don't want executive board statements in which you choose a certain side. Um, so that's the, that's the larger ma majority, I would say. And then there's the group that um, uh, wants to ask the uh, group that is fighting for the Palestinian cause to be uh, silenced within the university. So not having their events, not having the Palestinian uh, uh, posters all around in our buildings, and so, and so forth, and so, and so forth. And whatever you do as an executive board, it is never okay. Uh, whatever I do or don't do, you always get critique. Um, the question is also, and that's a question also for this audience, should we stop cooperating with countries whose governments are seriously violating uh, international rights and human rights law? Do we continue our partnership with institutions in Israel and in Palestine? Or do we say as universities, no, we stop that co cooperation? Also to give a signal uh, to the institutions in these countries about the violations that we witness every day uh, on our uh, television uh, programs. You tell me. Um, I would say still, uh, you know, we don't stop cooperation with individual institutions in countries whose governments viola violate uh, human rights or other international legal norms. We also cooperate with Saudi, where we have a female medical school. I've also visited uh, that female medical school because I believe in dialogue also between academics and between individual institutions who you also discuss what kind of common values you have and where maybe it becomes a little bit more sour. Those discussions and dialogues are actually really, really very enriching. Uh, so I would always want to fight to continue dialogue on that level. Uh, sometimes people say when uh, the world is at war, science is not. And that is a statement I really would like to adhere to. On the other hand, if groups within my community say, well, Rihanna, when the apartheid period uh, took place, universities stopped working with South Africa, and that had an effect with all the other interventions that took place. So now, if you look at Israel-Palestine, why don't you then stop now as Dutch universities together, of course, collectively? These are really, really uh, very difficult uh, dilemmas. And they were less difficult for me when I was not president of a university. It was much easier to also on your social media uh, express your concerns about what you see uh, in the world. And it's also for that reason, I think, really important that we stand still by the fact that we have the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration. And that's up to each of us here in this room who have a human rights heart to think about what is my role in what I see in the world. Is my role an academic role? Is my role more of an activist role? What is my role as president of a university? What can I do to increase the discussion on the importance of human rights, and in particular the importance to have impact with the human rights that we have developed together? That brings me to my third and final part of my uh, spontaneous uh, lecture. That has to do with more the academics here in the room. Um, because if you are an academic, you start as an academic, eh, as, a, as a PhD, and then you want to grow, often people want to grow upon the academic ladder. And you, uh, and you work in the topics that we all work on, whether it's uh, human rights, international criminal law, international law, it always has to do with topics that are very much visible in society. It's often not only the theory in which we work. Eh? You see our topics every day in society. And what I found difficult in the first time of my, in the first phase of my academic career is that we had a lot of focus on the academic side of the development of us as uh, scientists, academics, uh, through the lens of the output that we create in our academic uh, articles, in our uh, the number of grants that we would 
uh, be able to achieve also very much individualized. Eh? So I was very happy that Nicola just uh, uh, introduced me saying Rihanna and the team received a huge research grant. I put that in on purpose in all of my bios that are out there because you don't work alone in uh, as, a, as an academic. Eh? You work in a team, whether it's in a scholarly team on research topics, whether it's and together deciding who does the teaching in which period, whether it's leadership roles, and whether it's the way that you want to have impact with the work that you do. It's all a team effort. It's never an individualized uh, journey. If you then look at the way that we, are, we were, to some extent, assessed as academic staff, it was a, a quite a one-dimensional uh, assessment approach, also with me, who very soon realized that working alone and working only with legal scholars would not help me in analyzing the way that I would like to see the law work in practice. I needed different disciplines there. People from criminology, people, people from anthropology, people from political science. That's what we gathered at some point in Intervict. And together, we could address the question, now what is the impact of law in situations of massive violence what is the impact of these international institutions that we have developed in order to see how we can enforce these legal norms? Well, I can tell you from the video results that I have now ready, the impact is very little in the four cases that we studied on the lives of those we aim to protect. That was the focus in my study. Yeah? It's the victimized populations. The impact of the legal norms and the impact of the legal institutions there to enforce the norms is very little. And that is, for me, a big concern that we all here, also in this audience, need to reflect upon. What does that mean? This whole case study approach was done with a team of interdisciplinary scholars with whom you write in a much different way than a traditional legal scholar would do. When I was assessed, and you were not there yet, Geert, so I cannot put it on your shoulders, uh, but previously, the question in my annual appraisal meeting was, but where are your single-authored papers? I said, single-authored papers? I, I don't do that anymore. Because I work with a group of interdisciplinary uh, scholars. We, we write together. And I also don't do handbooks anymore. And I, I have a different way of making my scientific knowledge known to the outside world. And... The number of grants, okay, it's important because we also have to make sure that our uh, faculties can flourish. Yeah? So in that sense, of course, funding is important, but it's not the only thing. And the question, okay, Rihanna, what did you do to create this impact was never posed. So my work for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, where I was an expert witness for five years, didn't count. My work in supervisory boards for victim support didn't count. It was all appreciated, but it didn't count. And that, I think, is a fundamental mistake in the way that we assess our academic staff and also develop career paths if we also want to have impact with the work that we do. Because otherwise, people will still remain strategically developing their careers because we are also very much ambitious and want to grow in our careers. And then we will focus on that, on what we are assessed. Now, luckily, there is a change. There's also hope, eh? otherwise oh, everyone gets sour in this room and I don't want that. There is hope also at Tilburg University. <laughs> Wim, I'm so happy that the, all the influential people are sitting here uh, because what we have tried to do for the last seven years. That's actually why I left Tilburg. I never wanted to leave Tilburg because I loved working and studying here, but I was so frustrated with the system in which we were working and in which we were assessed that the role in Maastricht where I could become rector could help me in changing this whole system of recognizing and rewarding our academic staff. That was the only reason why I left. N never because I didn't enjoy uh, my uh, 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 field of, of, of work anymore. No, but I did know I'm going to leave this system because in this system, I cannot develop the way I think we should be able to develop as academics. 
Now, the recognition and rewards uh, program, movement, whatever you, you want to call it, is set out to do just that, to develop academic career paths for our staff in which a diversity of talents can be um, recognized, should also lead to new career paths. So that means that people who are very good in leadership and also in research and education, that's, we are in university where research and education is always crucial. Always, that should also stick together. But if you excel, for instance, in the domain of research and you also have a leadership role, you should have less tasks on other domains, for instance, creating impact with your work of uh, delivering a lot of education, but also the other way around. So if you are vice dean, uh, the vice dean of research or education in your school of law, and you also provide education, and you all do that in a very, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a in a very good way, and you still do your research, but you're not at that point in your career uh, putting all the hours in your research uh, career. You should be acknowledged for the fact that you are doing that and you should also grow in your career. It will create also better leaders, I can promise you, because now sometimes people are in leadership roles that should never have been appointed in a leadership role, but should focus on their research or education. Everyone will be happier then. Now that, <laughs> sorry to say that, Wim will know that sometimes the HR cases we get at our desk could have been solved if we had then already had some recognition and reward and therefore uh, different leadership. But I truly believe, and then I will close because I really want to listen also to your, uh, your own ideas, both on speaking out on topics relating to whether it's Israel, Palestine or our election results, another big concern, a, a really big concern, not only within my own Maastricht community, where the group of international staff and students really m are sharing their sense of no, not belonging anymore. That is a big concern. And so what do we do about that? But secondly, also on the way that you as a human rights scholar and as a human rights activist, coming maybe from scholarly work, how you would feel uh, better facilitated to do the work that you would love to do. And that can be either going for the uh, ERC starting grant or the advanced grant, because we need those people. But we also need people that can go to a television show and explain the importance of human rights uh, in our education, vocational, uh, high schools, you name it. Uh, you need people who are able to go into a discussion with politicians all of these different roles we need, in particular in human rights uh, areas. And I would really hope that in the next phase of our law school, I still say our, of uh, Tilburg University, that in particular in the area of human rights, people get the opportunity to develop the talents that they have, in, again, in a team effort, to make sure that the impact on the lives of people who need it most through these enforcements of human rights will be strengthened. And the staff can do it, but you cannot be the five legged sheep that has to do everything. We really have to make sure that we diversify the career paths, we join forces with other societal stakeholders in making sure that the lived reality of people in the human rights uh, discourse that we are so uh, familiar with becomes also a lived reality. I think that is what I would hope for everyone. In the few weeks before Christmas, eh, that's, I think everyone needs hope. Uh, that's what I would hope for, uh, for the law school, but actually for, uh, for everyone. Thank you very much. I will leave it here because then we have 15 minutes to get some of your feedback, other questions that you have. I didn't talk about the VD, which was the agreement, because I felt uh, we should talk about these topics. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Rianne. Thank you for your uh, inspiring words. I, uh, 
I sort of uh, knew it would be inspiring because um, the leadership you've shown, we had, someone called you the godmother of recognition and rewards. And I think, uh, speaking on for myself, I find it extremely inspiring what you do. And I think you've inspired so many scholars uh, in this movement and things are really getting, are really changing, which I find really, uh, really inspiring. I also am very happy you felt uh, free to check out your keynote and sort of have this more uh, spontaneous from the heart uh, lecture, which I think also probably takes some courage because being a president of the university, uh, perhaps I should also ask them, but you are much less autonomous and t it takes some courage, I would say, to speak, uh, speak out like this. So I really appreciate it. I appreciate uh, also being personable, personal. I love the failing forward. I'm going to remember that one. And, um, uh, and thanks for pointing out the dilemmas. Uh, I know this university also um, fa is faced with exactly the same dilemmas. So I'd be really interested to hear um, reflections also and questions to Professor Lechert. We have a microphone uh, going around. So um, if anyone wants to ask a question, please raise your hand so we can give you the mic. Yes, okay, it's working. Um, so thank you so much for your inspiring words. Um, Something I wanted to ask, I'm a student of Tilburg University. Um, sometimes people think that the higher the position, the more the impact. So you aim for, okay, when I will be there, then I will have bigger impact. But you also shared with us that it gets a little bit tricky, the also the higher you go. Um, so can you suggest me like something like, when did you experience that impact starts to be visible and noticed? Like when, can we always make a difference or is there a moment when you really see um, you, you reach the impact? Like you feel like, okay, now I'm really making an impact. What made you think that? Thank you. Thank you, that's a nice question. Yeah, what it's, when I was um, um, more, um, when not the entire institution would feel that you represent the entire institution, that, that that's what we do in our roles. It was for me easier to speak out from my own professional judgment or maybe also at times uh, uh, with my personal views on what I saw in the world and what I wanted to share in my maybe frustration or in my concerns and then Sometimes that also could have impact yeah, with regard to the roles that I had as an expert witness for the Lebanon Tribunal. During the time that I did that, I had to be quiet because that was also part of the agreement with the tribunal. But I also said after the five years, I want to be able to write about this and also share my experiences with other tribunals and other uh, initiatives of setting up new ad hoc tribunals. And you, can, you could have impact there. And it was very easy or not easy, I never had to reflect, hmm, what will it mean if I now put out a tweet or a LinkedIn message or uh, an official report? And now in my role, uh, it's not so much the higher you get, because it's, it's not really high where we are in the sense that uh, it's, it's high, but it's a function in which you represent the uh, entire community and representing the interests of the entire community that is of course also diverse in its views and opinions makes it now um, twice, three times, five times, ten times, sometimes before I come out with what I, what I think. But it also makes me feel that I'm a coward sometimes. I don't know if Wim uh, would feel the same. Sometimes I know that I'm reluctant, whereas if I would not have that hat, I would not have been that reluctant. And um, then it's also about leadership. What kind of leadership do you dare to uh, reveal? on topics that are societally sensitive. And I'm struggling there. Uh, if I'm not becoming too much of a coward, also because of the fact that you so s easily get, uh, yeah, uh, canceled indeed. Uh, also, yeah, absolutely, whether on social media, of course, but also in your own profession. We very much like in our Dutch culture, I think at the moment to um, accuse people immediately at a very personal level, which can have very damaging effects. And the media also doesn't, the, the regular media doesn't pay, play, play a very constructive role often in those situations because of which you even become more hesitant to speak out. But it's all not good for the causes that we are fighting for. 
but it's really a dilemma, so I don't have a good answer to your question. But it's, uh, but it doesn't have to do with the, the hierarchy or the rank that you're in. It has to do with the, what you represent in your uh, position and whether you can say it's an individual scholarly view or opinion or whether you represent a larger uh, entity. For me, that is the difference. Um, hi, thank you very much. That was indeed very inspiring. Um, Julian Moussou, Assistant Professor in Legal History here. Um, uh, I, I, um, there are so many things I'd like to say, but I will keep it short about this impact thing. We've been talking a lot here as well about this conflict, boycotting, not boycotting, etc. But just about the impact, there is also something that keeps um, worrying me or at least running in my mind all the time. Isn't there in our urge to create impact also something that is extremely Western? <laughs> in reacting immediately. Isn't an impact precisely the sense of humility and, and, and silence for, for a moment and create precisely what you said very rightly, I think, um, not speak out immediately, but precisely create this, um, this sphere, this, this room for discussion and create, create the room to, to pr I mean, as, um, as also educators to create um, the room for uh, vocabulary to talk precisely mm -hmm. either with colleagues abroad. I've been actually contacting both Palestinian and, and Israeli colleagues who are a bit worried about our positioning um, and, uh, and, and, and anyway, so th they are precisely willing to, to discuss and isn't that precisely the impact also not creating an impact as we would imagine or as it is measurable? but creating this room for a vocabulary, um, yeah, mm -hmm. aiming to have a vocabulary to be able to speak and exchange. That would be maybe another way to look at it. Yeah, I think that's very important what you say. And I think it's also an important lesson that we should give our students in our classes. Uh, because what I see in some parts of our student community is that the requests or the demands for statements on an, any topic uh, is increasing. Whereas sometimes with regard to topics, I don't even have a position because it's so complex that I'd rather have the uh, dialogue in trying to learn, okay, what should or could lead to a certain position. Also in the, in the situation of Palestine, Israel, I can have a position on the violations on civilians on both sides. That's very easy, eh? at least for me, from my uh, point of view. But to contextualize what is happening and to see also what could be a way to the future that requires so much analysis and, and, and different expert views and discussions. And I would hope that also for our teachers, and that also has, I think, a role for us as, as boards, deans, vice deans on education, is how do we make sure that also in the classroom that the first thing is not we want a statement. And even to the extent that the statement that is being asked, in this case from, for instance, Wim and myself, is not a nuanced statement, it's taking sides. And then dialogue can take place. Yeah, that's not dialogue. Um, and I think there we have a role as educational institutions to educate our students what an academic debate is about and how you have such a debate in safety and with the values that go with it. So totally agree with you. But I, I see we move to another direction, honestly. Um, so I'm completely new here. This is the first time I'm here at Tilburg University, but still a question. So the first thing <laughs> is you speak about impact and the question is uh, how can you generate, what, what should we do to really have some impact in this uh, conflict in Israel? Huh? But something, so what would be the wisest thing to do? But something which uh, amazes me is that the conflict in Israel is uh, something which is relatively small and it's already there for a long time and it was already an unstable situation. We have a much bigger conflict which is of much more importance which has not been mentioned here and that is of course a conflict mm -hmm. between yeah. Russia yeah. and Ukraine which depending on the outcome will have far more influence in the world. So what could we do to have impact um, there? Yeah, that's... Uh <laughs> It's like, if I have the answer, I'll probably win the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, yeah, that's very good questions. And also the, the fact that you mentioned also, of course, the uh, uh, 
uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, I had it in my in my notes, but didn't mention it anymore because I did the spontaneous version. Because that is, of course, also um, very much a topic that is being discussed also from within the university. And if you make the parallel with the situation now in Israel-Palestine, when Russia, um, uh, when the Russian aggression on Ukraine took place, we used these words immediately, also as universities, also in our statements, um, while also saying to our own community, of course, we're also there for our Russian colleagues and our Russian students who are in need of assistance. But we were quite quick also in the association of the universities to have a statement out. With regard to Israel-Palestine, we were all like, okay, what's going to be the statement? What's going to be the headline of the statement? That's first, and in answer also to your, uh, your first remark, or why I didn't mention it, because I should have. With regard to how do we create impact, um, yeah, that, that there are so many answers to that, to that question. If I look at this audience with the, uh, the identity of the people sitting here, people working in human rights, uh, studying human rights, uh, advocating human rights, I sometimes really believe that we have, um, that we have to, to, to reflect upon the way that we increase the discourse on the importance of human rights in our own countries, but also in other countries. I miss this whole discourse in our uh, public debates, in our public opinions, and it has, there have been interventions on in including human rights uh, values in education for younger kids up to universities, but I don't see it that much actually anymore. I have also two younger children. I never hear them talk about human rights. Uh, if, if you talk about uh, an election result with a party that violates uh, the right to religion, we don't use these words. We, we, we maybe will do, but the public opinion in general, we don't use it anymore. And if we want to, if, I think we take it to, for granted too much. That history is so short. Eh? If, you, if you look at the 75 years ago, that's so short. And still we take it for granted. And there, yeah, I don't have the right answer to you how we will solve the conflict in Israel, Palestine or uh, Russia, Ukraine. Absolutely not. But I do believe that within our own circle of control, because that's wh where we uh, have control, we really have to think of how we make the human rights discourse in our countries, in our curricula, in our governments, much more prominently uh, visible, discussable, uh, practicable than we are doing at the moment. That would be my wish, but. Thanks, Kiana, for your interesting speech and your inspiring words. Um, you talk about the human rights discourse and how this uh, plays or does not play a role in society, maybe. But if you look at it more broadly, um, I think you see an increasingly skeptical and negative stance towards uh, facts and science sometimes in the political and societal debate. And do you have any ideas on how we can improve the situation? Yeah, also a very good question. Um, <laughs> easy questions. Uh, yeah, well, we had, uh, I, d I, d I participated in a demonstration a few years ago. I think the slogan was, uh, science is not an opinion. Eh? You can have, you have the right to your own opinion, but you don't have the right to your own facts. Um, that is, I think, something we have to clearly uh, remember. Eh? But then still, of course, also in science, uh, having agreement on the facts is, of course, even uh, more and more um, yeah, um, undermined. There again, I think it is really important that we as universities and as universities of applied sciences, but also back in the school years before, that we also educate our children on the importance of uh, how to uh, divide uh, knowledge with the sources that you have to, um, the, 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 the way that you come to uh, the right kind of scientific information. That is very difficult now for children. If I look at my own kids, if I see what kind of information they get in their, uh, in their timelines, they don't judge, apparently, is this scientific information or valid information or true information, it's just information. So the digital literacy of our kids in how to make that distinction between what is fake and what is 
not fake and how it became part of uh, the information that you should rely on, that, that starts at, the, at primary school. Uh, that doesn't start at university. Then we're way too late. And that is also with the whole chat GDP uh, development really di posing difficulty also to our uh, uh, educational institutions. And for us as scientists, what we need to do is to make sure that the, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the research and the analysis that we present to society are created following the scientific integrity rules that we have. And there, unfortunately, I have to say, also sometimes still things go wrong. I had a big article in the Dutch newspaper this weekend uh, from a, a colleague who violate those basic scientific integrity rules. And what happens then in my WhatsApp is that people that I know start WhatsApping me, what is this again? Uh, another scientist that is uh, violating the rules and producing uh, bad results based on bad methodology and uh, using uh, fraudless methods. That doesn't help. So it's also looking in the mirror ourselves that we have to play according to the rules that we have created together. But for the, for the, 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 the public opinion or the public using our information, there, I believe we really have to uh, redesign the way that we train our kids on how to evaluate the information, how to search for the information, where to search for the information. That is a whole different ball game than when I did my PhD, it's, I went to the library here eh? and I, I had to ask a week before if I could have a certain book and then the book would, I could pick up the book after a week. And articles, well, that became a little bit more efficient at some point. That's like 20 years ago. Now, they don't come to the library for books. They study there and they have a whole different uh, digital world. I always say uh, we are like digital migrants. The kids are digital natives. Eh? So uh, we need to educate them in a completely different way. Now an easy question. <laughs> I also thank you so much for this very inspiring le lecture. And um, I just have a question for some advice because I noticed that um, also as an academic, I really struggle lately with expressing myself because I noticed that a lot of people, family, friends within the community, but also like non-academic um, acquaintances, they come to me for a, they expect a value judgment or a statement on certain topics and they rely on it because they come to you for information. They, they think, oh, you're an academic, you must have an answer or your insight must be very valuable. Can you please guide me? Can you judge me with the elections? I'm, I'm in environmental justice. Um, so also in this topic, but uh, definitely with um, the most recent conflict with Palestine and Israel, I have a very strong um, an emotional uh, opinion about this, but I feel that people asking me also have very strong emotions and I don't want to respond as an academic with an emotional response to maybe even increase polarization or increase their, their rage or something like that. So do you maybe have advice on how to yeah, respond, um, not ignoring your emotion, but in a more nuanced way? way and, and also create more space for dialogue in that sense as an academic. Yeah, I think as an academic, you always have to be careful that uh, what you say on a topic that is not actually your academic field per se, where maybe the public would expect you to have answers on everything, that you have to make very clear that that is then not your academic, uh, academically argued answer, but that it's your personal view. Uh, with the emotions that go with it. Because otherwise you might get into a situation that you will be criticized for expressing views that may be personal, but that may be academically. If you then look again at the academic uh, yeah, rules or whatever, the, the practices through which we get to certain statements or views or analysis are not, um, are not followed. So I would always say if I am asked on topics that are not my, uh, it's not my academic expertise. I will say it's my uh, um, uh, view that I uh, withdraw from this and this or that, but it's not my academic uh, expertise. So I'd rather have you consult someone who's really the expert on this. Because otherwise you really could become also professionally uh, yeah, being criticized in a way that you would not want to be criticized.
Thank you, Liana, for dealing with all these very yeah, nice. questions. Uh, <laughs> Thank you.